psychologist, yes, I'm supposed to help people change work. People don't change work. <laughs> I get people come in all the time, you know, and they, they want to forgive me, but uh, Fritz Radl, famous psychologist, said most people come to see a psychologist or a therapist to turn their bullshit into horseshit. <laughs> and I know that the idea is not to try to change people, but to steer them, to help shape their direction. I have an 11-year-old boy that I mentioned. He was kicking in utero, and he's been kicking ever since. I didn't get the, the freaking chance to try to mold something. He's always been that way. He still is that way. But what I try to do is shepherd him through life by directing him in ways that that energy and his challenging will be something hopefully productive for him in his life. But he's not the essence of who he is. Forget it. I, I was a hostage negotiator when I started in 1980. I did that for 15 years. 141 incidents that I, I was involved in. I would rather negotiate a psychotic terrorist than my 11 year old. <laughs> He's got my number. You know, he's got <laughs> Genetics, I say this because it, it, is, it forms part of the lens by which we look through things. It's by no stretch of the imagination the, the only defining thing in our lens. But it is part of the filter by which we start to think. Obviously, er, early childhood makes a difference. There was a 2001 study called Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And, and most recently, it's been said that adverse early child, childhood experiences is the number one variable in potential PTSD. Because I, I work a lot with returning vets and, and police officers who've been involved in traumatic events. And it is quite remarkable how some of that susceptibility is increased. We've even seen in the last six months studies that suggest that trauma-related Trauma-related events in a parent's life can be genetically expressed in their child. My mother was a concentration camp victim. She was in five Nazi concentration camps. I sat up and took notice because, again, what they're suggesting is that there's a genetic expression that has an impact on the neurotransmissions of your brain. When I say genetic expression, that means serotonin and dopamine in my brain are affected by that experience somehow. So again, when I talk about genetics, I'm not saying it's the be all and end all, but we have to have some accounting for how we look at things. Why am I telling you this? Because is it helpful to know if you have a family history of something? If you have bipolar illness in your family, is it helpful to know that? Or do, would you rather just not know? 20% pass through from a parent, bipolar illness. And, and I know this, the topic here is critical thinking, but I want you to understand that critical thinking is affected by a number of different layers that constitute the view that you have of almost everything. And what, what I'm going to try to focus on before we leave here is how do you counteract some of that? Because to be fair-minded is difficult when you have all these influences that start to, to have you see things in a particular way. Let me throw one out that will seem a little bit out of the blue, but I'll try to make that connection for you. How is it that an esteemed institution like Penn State, with all those smart, important people running that place, could foster an environment for a child predator and turn their head the other way? How could that be? Now, it's not, it's not easy to understand why Enron was the way it was, because it's all about greed. But we're talking Penn State here. There are forces at play that make people influenced in the way they want to look at things. And again, I'm not going to be the, the crusader that says we can change the world this way, but I want you to be aware so that you can use your free will and take a step back and say, is this, my view of this, really fair-minded? Or am I being influenced by other things? And that's certainly the case in analysis and analyzing data. And we're going to do an exercise in that. Hopefully, I can get the AV equipment you know, up and moving. Good. The psychology of intel analysis. What hinders accurate 
intelligent analysis are inherent human mental processes that are extremely difficult to do something about, like genetics. Conscious awareness of the workings of one's own mind doesn't necessarily prevent, but that's where we're going today, weaknesses and biases because perception, memory, and information processing are conducted prior to and independently of conscious direction. You already have a whole, a whole backlog and a cataloging of experiences that will help to shape your perception of something. Let me jump to another um, critical thinking element that I've been involved in. I testify in trials for police officers, not for police officers, to educate juries. I, I don't get hired by a police officer to do that or by their attorneys. I come in, I don't even meet the police officer, but I come in and I talk to a jury about what happens in a situation when an officer shoots somebody and there's no gun, which is of course part and parcel of what's being called the Ferguson effect now around the country. I've testified in probably close to 10 trials just that way because I don't like to overuse that either. You don't want to be called as an expert witness and say, well, Dr. Goldstein, how many times have you done this? Oh, 300? Oh, that's how you make your living. That's not what I'm talking about. The jury deserves a fair understanding, the critical thinking process that is involved in making a 150 millisecond decision to shoot a weapon. It's 150 milliseconds. It's not just for guns, by the way. I don't know if you all knew each other when you walked in here today. Some of you did, some of you didn't. But in 150 milliseconds, you look at somebody and you make up your mind real quickly. You ever walk into a group of strangers and that's what you do, right? You scan people. Look at her. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's an idiot. Oh, do you know that guy? No, but look at him. 150 milliseconds. Where does that come from? Where does that preference and evaluation come from? It comes from your past experience. That your brain will never forget. The amygdala houses and archives every intense emotional experience you've ever had in your life. And it will never forget. It's there for your protection. And that's where, where heuristics come from. If you see somebody who, let's say, is talking or walking a particular way, and you make a decision about it. You know, I've spent most of my life in the mental health field, uh, behavioral science, uh, psychology, and working with dangerous people. I remember I was walking down a, a street. Uh, my wife and I were traveling in Europe. We're walking down a street, and um, she's looking at the stores, and I say, I say, come on, baby, let's cross the street. She says, no, I wanna look at those stores. I said, cross the street. And she says, why? I said, there's a guy coming towards us. I don't wanna be in a confrontation. She's looking at me, what do you mean a confrontation? I said, this guy's nuts. That's not a clinical term, right? I said, baby, this guy's nuts. She said, well, of all the people in the world, you should be able to handle it. I said, I don't want to work. I don't want to work. Can't we just cross the street and avoid this guy? And what I'm saying is I'm picking up on, on a heuristic. You know, my, my brain is going, this guy's going to say something to me. And I know myself. And I don't want to get involved and broiled in a struggle with something. If he says something to my wife, I'm probably going to do something. So let me walk away the other side of the street and not get involved in this. The heuristic, again, the, 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 the mindset that comes from the experience I've had with working with people who appear to be, he was walking in a way that I, I knew. I just knew it. And I didn't want to engage. I didn't want to engage with the guy. And what I'm trying to get to you is that the last comment here, we tend to perceive what we expect to perceive as well. So am I doing that because I'm expecting it or is there a legitimate threat? For me, it's, e it's an easy decision because it's just crossing the street. So I'm not gonna worry too much about it. <coughs> New information becomes assimilated to existing images. So if you think you see something, let me go back to testimony. I'm in the Danzinger Bridge, you could Google it, Danzinger Bridge incident. I'm testifying to the jury. I'm being grilled by the, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Civil Rights of the United States, who's challenging me to say, so, Dr. Goldstein, are you trying to tell me that people can see something that's not there? I said, absolutely. Authority.
authoritatively, yes, the brain does that. The brain plays a game called Name That Tune. Does anybody remember that reference, Name That Tune? Oh, a few of you, thank God. Uh, Name That Tune was a game show. And the game show was this, that they played a note, you have two contestants, and you try to guess the song. Well, that's exactly what the brain does. Any familiarity of a song, or in this case, a note, symbolically, the brain will remember it and call it. That's, that's the song. So when somebody, when a police officer says, put your hands up, I want your hands up, let me see your hands, and somebody goes here, the brain says, what's that song? Am I going home tonight? Is this guy going home tonight? And the public just does not understand this. 150 millisecond decision. No time to consult, no time to contemplate, no time to think. A guy goes in here, and I'll tell you the one that was widely known, uh, and I consulted on this uh, to, to, their, um, to, their, uh, to their defense as a consultant. This was uh, the, uh, the four, four officers involved in the Amidal Diallo case in New York City. You may recall that Amidal Diallo uh, was shot 41 times, 41 times. Not easy to, to, you know, for the public to stomach. And what it had to do with, just so you know, is that he was identified in a lookout. They were in what was called a hot spot in New York, a place of, of, of a lot of uh, crime activity. They approached him and asked, that there, were, there were four of them, one out in front, one officer out in front with his gun drawn, said, show me your hands. The three are behind him and he trips, discharging his weapon. The three behind him think he's been hit. But the guy in the foyer, you know, that's what their brain went to. That our guy's been hit. Boom, 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 boom. Empty the clips. Tragic death of Mr. Diallo. Mr. Diallo was innocent. He went into his pocket to show his papers. Not for a gun. He had no gun. But again, not understanding what was going on. And fear. The fear activation system in the brain is incredibly quickly, instantaneously tied to our fight or flight response, right? That guarantees our survival as best as possible. Fight or flight, right? The hormones and the neurotransmitters, they, they get immediately enacted and activated, help us to make, once that fear activation, and there's no contemplation, it, it just happens. And unfortunately, um, people, innocent people do die. And I don't want to preempt what I'm going to say about the war on police, but clearly there are situations where there are human error and tragic circumstances in which people without guns have been shot. Um, what I did say to that jury, though, is the, the suggestion that these officers woke up that morning and decided they want to kill people is absurd. They themselves had just been through the uh, Katrina. They were homeless themselves, these officers. There was no command structure, no communication structure. They get a call out to come to Danzinger Bridge because their shots fired on a police officer. The supervisor, with the only eyes on the, the top because they're in a rental truck, comes out shooting because he identifies who he thinks is the shooter. And so, of course, the people that filed out behind him thought the same. Then they find the guy, they kill the guy and injured uh, two or three others. And um, of course, that's what they went to trial for. The problem was that the supervisor tried to, to cover it up. When they found out he had no gun, they replaced the gun, they made up a story. He did. And now they're all in jail. And I guarantee you they would not have gone to jail. The guys in the Amidal Diallo case didn't go to jail because the jury understood what took place. It was a tragic error. So, Part of what we're talking about here is that despite ambiguous or fuzzy stimuli or evidence, people will form a tentative hypothesis in a first impression that is increasingly stronger despite contrary evidence. This is the amazing thing. You will get contrary evidence and you go, no. Now sometimes we call these people stubborn, but we all have elements of this that we're, no, 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 my experience tells me that it's this way. 
you know, and, and you're not going to talk me out of that. Let's take a look, for instance.